Good day, everybody. Welcome to Let's Talk SADS live from Canada. I am your host, Dr. Shubayan Sanitani, and uh, I am coming to you from Vancouver and uh, delighted to be here in this, uh, in this uh, setting. I am trying out a new ring light, which I see I should have set up before because it just makes a weird spot on my glasses. So we're going to do it in the dark. All right. So welcome. So as you know, this is Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month. So here we are just past the midway point in the month and coming to you with another one of our webcasts, which uh, are really an opportunity for collaborative learning, where uh, I get to ask our guests some questions that we hope are going to help educate all of us about various aspects of sudden arrhythmia, death syndromes, SADS conditions that we are all impacted by uh, in our lives. And so uh, yesterday was in fact, um, yesterday was in fact a big day in the cardiac arrest realm. And I hope you can see my slides. Yesterday was World Restart a Heart Day. And uh, Canadian SADS was, of course, part of this awareness campaign. And uh, I saw lots of places taking the opportunity to refresh people's skills on CPR and AED, Automated External Defibrillator Deployment. And um, if you didn't get to it yesterday, that's okay. You can carry on. Uh, the whole month of October is Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month. And this is really important an important skill where you might save a life. And so uh, that was yesterday. Now, um, a few months in the making, the Canadian SADS Foundation organized an auction, and it was a national auction that was held at the uh, end of September. Um, and people donated some amazing prizes. There were hockey, hockey games. There were there were uh, there was an AED in there, um, other life uh, lifestyle things and great gifts, great value, and that raised eleven thousand um, dollars, which is amazing. So give yourselves a, a round of applause, a pat on the back, and thank you to all our generous sponsors who donated uh, gifts for auction, and thank you for those of you who uh, donated. So. Um, I always like to speak a bit to this because people might wonder uh, why Canadian SADS might even need fundraising, but it's really so that we can keep uh, improving our knowledge. And uh, I think one of our goals is to get towards an in-person educational day. Um, I, I keep bugging uh, Pam Husband, our wonderful executive leader, um, that maybe we're going to try for an in-person meeting in, in next year. but. Um, so your funds are, are very helpful. Also just to keep the organization running, um, people donate a lot of their time as volunteers, but also, uh, we need some staff. Now SADS has a busy month and, uh, is going to be spending some time in Montreal. So CanNet is actually a, uh, something, an organization that started from the Canadian Heart Rhythm Society's collaborative efforts to fund a, a research network um, across Canada. And many of us are part of this network that provides grants for uh, improving knowledge, doing research in the space of sudden, sudden arrhythmia deaths. And um, our very own uh, communications uh, leader is uh, going to be there next week. Um, Evan Kruger is presenting a poster, and I think Pam's going to be there as well. This is in partnership with um, with the Canadian SAS Foundation and the CanNet next week in Montreal. And that, I think they're going to stay there for another few days because that, that rolls right into vascular 2023, which is um, sometimes known as the Canadian cardiovascular meeting, but through a UBC partnership recognition grant, the Canadian SADS Foundation 
has uh, received an opportunity in partnership with Hero Hearts in Rhythm to attend the Vascular Conference and uh, definitely are going to be present there. So swing by the booth, booth 808, um, when you're in Montreal uh, for the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress or Vascular. So that's really some big, some big progress. So if I think about what, what Pam and Evan and the other members of the board have cre you know, managed to do this year, it's been a real revitalization of, of the Canadian SADS group. Now, when I started this, I thought I was going to bring a little bit of, I called it Canadian fun facts, but it's turned into really more of a history lesson um, of Canadian medical highlights. Um, and uh, the learning part has been fun for me. And um, so we're going to continue on with that. Um, and today's fun fact uh, really ties into our guest. So this is an excerpt from this. And it's based, if you read the side there, to whom such bodies shall be delivered. This is an excerpt from the act to regulate and facilitate the study of anatomy. Now, technically, I've cheated a little because this was done in 1843. And at that time, it was done in the province of Canada because Canada had not yet become a nation. And the reason they needed to do this was um, because, as you can see here, if there be any public medical school in the locality, such school shall have a preferable claim to any such body. So this was really an era where people needed to learn about anatomy and learn about medicine and bodies were being literally snatched from cemeteries and people would often the police especially they they would be involved in these cases where bodies would go missing and so here's a bit more of the act so this was an act to regulate and facilitate the study of anatomy um, in 1843 and so in november i'm going to give a bit of an explanation of how you, the viewers, and the Canadian SADS supporters are going to be able to participate in a contest uh, with a prize. And um, it will involve a knowledge of all these historical facts. So that said, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest today. And Dr. Heyer is um, are, is the chief coroner of Ontario and has long been a partner to the Canadian SADS Foundation and has really done some groundbreaking work. He received his medical degree at the University of Toronto in 1986 and then served as a coroner since 1992, so just over 30 years, um, and has gradually uh, risen through the ranks to become the chief coroner. But rather than spend time telling you about some of the really important things. I'd like to bring him into the studio and I'm going to ask him to talk about a bit of this himself. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and welcome uh, Dr. Dirk Heyer to our SADS webcast. Welcome. Is it all right if I call you Dirk? I prefer that. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation and I'm honored to be here, especially during this month of cardiac arrest. Well, thanks for thanks for making the time. I know you have a very busy schedule, and uh, being the chief coroner a, a, of a large province with a lot of active health issues uh, is uh, is probably keeping you uh, very busy. As, as we talked about a little bit, I want to go back to some some personal story about you. So, if you could just you know, if you could give us a bit of your connection to. SADS and the Canadian SADS, kind of how you, how you ended up in this, in this current position, uh, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. And I'll just do a little sidebar before I get started. And um, thanks for putting up the Anatomy Act. In fact, my other title is I'm the General Inspector of Anatomy for Ontario, and I administer the Anatomy Act of Ontario. And we could talk about that um, in great detail at another time. Um, but I also want to say, I want to acknowledge um, that I'm sure some of the, well, I'm not sure, but I, I, I guess some of the listeners have suffered loss, suffered uh, uh, loss of loved ones and, and or illness related to sudden cardiac uh, 
arrhythmic uh, events or cardiac arrest. And I want to acknowledge those and recognize that we're all continuing to do what we can to reduce that from happening to others. But take, taking my background, uh, Pam, um, I can't remember how many years ago, Pam and I had a number of different conversations. And what I saw as an investigating coroner is young people dying. And one of the key roles that we have is to try to learn from those deaths to see what we can do differently. And I'll take you back to one very, very notable um, experience that I had as a coroner where a, a young man who traveled from Southwestern Ontario to Toronto for a course suddenly died within the course. And he was, resuscitation was not successful. And as we were doing uh, the work to investigate his death through examination and some additional testing, um, I was probably too late or we were too late as a system in letting his brother know to go and get some testing and evaluation. And unfortunately he died as well. So that was one of the most personally challenging ones, not obviously more challenging for the family, but challenging for me as a coroner where I feel that I didn't do well for that second person and that potential. So around that time, we had been working, uh, Andy McCallum and Chris Cunningham, Andy McCallum, a former chief coroner and Chris Cunningham, a forensic pathologist, had been working and thinking, and Joel Kirsch, who is a cardiac, uh, pediatric cardiologist, had been working together to think about how do we um, respond from the Office of the Chief Coroner to help to identify situations where there may have been heritable contribution to help others within that family um, have the opportunity for testing and evaluation and treatments and care. Yeah, Ontario really has been a leader, uh, not just nationally, but really uh, internationally and in being very proactive. And we've had the, the privilege of, of both Dirk and, and Dr. Chris Cunningham coming and interacting at conferences and, and sharing some of their protocols and, and practices. So really outstanding work. And, um, and sadly, in, in Canada, it does matter a little bit where your where your sudden death or cardiac arrest occurs in terms of uh, your access to care and what will what will follow. So the Anatomy Act. So take take us back. I'm obviously a bit of a history uh, history nerd. When did like how far back did people go? Like how far back does this go where people said we can learn something from examining someone who has passed? You know, I. I, I I can sort of think of Leonardo da Vinci as being credited with this kind of thinking, but on a practical thing, it, it obviously reached a fever pitch if people are, you know, gr robbing graves in the, in the 1800s. Yeah, I think, I don't know exactly how far back it's gone, but, but there were always different purposes for why people might be um, accessing or examining or obtaining uh, deceased persons. And so, some would be for medicinal purposes. People would um, uh, access bodies for potentially um, things that might help other people get better. There were that was a long time ago. And then there's also the learning uh, that that has occurred both from a, a medical point of view. And so, what you brought forward would be something that would never happen today, which is an unclaimed person who would be. What I believe we do is we we speak for that unbit, unclaimed person because nobody else does. And so the last thing we're going to do is to uh, presume that they would have wanted to be donated for uh, uh, evaluation and learning. So nowadays, those donations are by consent by the person often and sometimes by the family member. But what we do in the death investigation system is we have two primary roles and we, we investigate and it's a provincial decision, as you talked about earlier, and legislation that defines it. But we investigate about 20% of all deaths that occur in Ontario. And within those, it's when something sudden and unexpected happens. And so that we can help give those answers to the families, give those answers to investigators, and to truly try to understand the circumstances, because they're so tragic and so horrible. And then secondarily, we say, is there something we can learn from that to help to make recommendations to prevent things from happening in the future. We made a conscious decision in Ontario that when somebody dies from a sudden cardiac death at a young age, being 
under my age, so under under 55, um, we will take that on as an investigation. In contrast to other jurisdictions, because it's a natural disease, it doesn't fall into the investigative framework in many situations. But we believe even if it's a, a witnessed and a known natural event, so no trauma, no violence, nothing that, a criminal, we believe it is something, and we do, we have policies, procedures that we do investigate those because we believe while the circumstances will be not as com complex, the benefit of the recommendation and the life-saving potential is so significant. Um, so that's the approach that we've taken in Ontario. Yeah, I think that's that's certainly something I, I want to emphasize is that, uh, there, you know, it, there's there's a focus in some jurisdictions about ruling out, you know, foul play or, you know, f sort of forensic or criminal cases that distracts a little bit from these, you know, clearly very important cases, you know, maybe numerically small compared to, you know, especially currently we, you know, we have a national, uh, you know, overdose crisis that's overwhelming uh, the system. Um, and, you know, still being able to put the, you know, put these cases as a priority for a, for an autopsy and investigation. And I just take also this opportunity because I know sometimes it's, it's challenging for us as healthcare professionals and, and, or as family members supporting a family who has just suffered this. I think it's so important to, you know, have the dialogue with the coroner about the possible life saving, uh, you know, the life saving potential of working with the coroner. Because, you know, the for the deceased, sadly, it's it's it is too late, and that and that's it's very hard, and and people are grieving and and dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of actually bureaucracy. There's a lot of you know paperwork, and it's overwhelming to have a family member pass suddenly. So it's very hard at that time to think of saving other people's lives. And that's where the coroner, I think, has a great uh, role, especially the way it's structured in Ontario, uh, to say, you know, let's make sure no one else in this family, uh, you know, can can be suffering or, you know, ha harbor this same condition. So really outstanding work in Ontario. Now, um, and then recently you've, you've really doubled down on, on this. Nice to hear Dr. Joel Kirsch's name mentioned. He is, of course, a, a colleague of mine and has transitioned to work more in your space. And then Dr. Catherine Allen, Katie Allen, who was our guest last month, she, she also is, a, is now in your, in your employ. Now, I think we may have lost. Did we lo lose Dr. Hire there? Let me, uh, oh, there we go. We've, uh, we had a little temporary, yeah, temporary we technical. He came off of the screen and he might have disconnected. All so, right. I won't take it personally, but yeah. Um, yeah. So Dr. Catherine Allen, Katie Allen, who was, uh, was our guest last month, uh, is also working now in the coroner office and, um, and, uh, and supporting the work that they are doing in Ontario. There we go. So, Got him, all right. Hey, quick disconnect. All right. All right. Did you kick me out? No, I, I think there's a disconnection there on your end, but there we go. We're good. So I'm sorry about that. It, I mentioned Dr. Catherine Allen, and the and the lights went out, so maybe I'm not allowed to to talk about talk about her. I was just saying that her she's been hired in your in your uh, office to also support the the investigations and the families. So if you could just say a you know a, a quick word about that role and and really that testimonial to your commitment to helping the SADS families. Yeah, it, it, you know we learn over years, and uh, you you reference CanNet in the past, and we've participated by being uh, collaborative with CanNet to share information. And, uh, and Katie Allen, Catherine Allen is a PhD um, with significant experience and knowledge. And Paul Dorian was also an early uh, contributor and collaborator with us. What we recognized is while we know how to do death investigation, we learned and recognized that there's importance on how do we communicate and how do we help families to navigate the system 
outside of our death investigation system. And we weren't doing as well as we could. We, in fact, have evaluated how the coroners shared information with families, and, and we recognized that we could do better. So we brought uh, Katie on board to advise us. And then through her advice, we realized, you know what? We want Katie to do this with us. So she's embedded into our organization, again, recognizing the importance of not only the investigative findings, but how to transmit that information in an effective, compassionate, caring, thoughtful way to help families to understand and to navigate. Um, and so we, this is something that we, we did on an interim basis and now full-time Katie's helping us do that, but most importantly, helping families. And it, 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 you can, those who have suffered loss, those who know people who have suffered loss know it, it can be very challenging, as you say, with the paperwork, but with the grief and everybody grieves in different ways. And so they should. Katie navigates that through with different families, um, bringing perspective to them and taking time and listening and helping. Yeah, no, fantastic. And we enjoyed talking to her about some of her work, especially the psychological impacts and, 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 and aftermath. So, so, uh, you know, one of the, one of the questions families often have is, you know, why does it take so long to, to hear back or to learn? They sort of feel like they're, they're in this, this void. Tell us a little bit about the process and, you know, without getting into, you know, all the details necessarily, but, you know, what's, you know, how, what's the process there? How long is it going to take? What's the communication strategy? Yeah, you know, I, I wish we had answers very quickly. And we try to, uh, we expect and we ask that the coroners are ongoingly having conversation and communication with families to keep them up to uh, knowledge as to what the steps are. But the first thing is the coroner uh, becomes involved and at times when it's sudden and unexpected and unwitnessed the police will be involved and so there's that early investigation to determine could there be a crime could there be something else unusual and then we'll proceed to the examination by the forensic pathologist and part of uh, often we don't find anything in the examination especially if it's a heritable uh, cardiac conduction abnormality when there isn't any structural abnormality that is challenging and then we proceed to toxicology testing, which because of the number of deaths that we investigate, and that's not an excuse, it's just reality and sad reality and the number of substance related deaths as you talked about, that takes time because we want to do it right. So doing it right and doing it to the best sometimes takes time. And as we're finding something, we may learn something more that we have to follow, which takes more time. So then after all of those results are in within the competing priorities of other areas of work, we then may do genetic testing, which then may further answer questions, which adds an additional capacity of time. So while we've narrowed it, we still it is still agonizingly long for families at times. If we see something right away at the autopsy, phenotypically, so a structural abnormality of the heart, then we've, with Katie coming on board, We've now shortened that time of communication to families to give them a preliminary information about the potential observation that occurs there. So we're striving to reduce time. We are uh, limited by capacity in, in resource and capacity in uh, personal, uh, professional involvement, but everything uh, continues to, to, to be uh, something that we try to move as quickly as we can with. And so for families, reaching out and asking us where we are and getting information. So that it shouldn't be an information void. It should be incremental information provision. And we're working on that as well. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the, that initially these scenes, they are, they are the scenes of a, you know, of a death. And so there, there is an initial feeling. And I've heard this from lots of families, you know, there's this sort of this criminal investigation, which, you know, if you have a, you know, a two-year-old die in your home, it's very hard to, you know, have this you know, feeling that your your house has become a crime scene and the, the line of questioning is, you know, is is challenging. Um, but it's a necessary, you know, it's a necessary step. There there are those, you know, those also very tragic, challenging cases. And, you know, we can't, we can't miss those. Um, 
and and certainly you know in British Columbia, for example, we are, we have primarily a forensic, uh, you know, based coroner system that that falls under a different, a totally different government structure, and not uh, not medical doctors uh, serving as as coroners. Now. You mentioned genetic testing. I think you know. I'd like to spend a moment to talk about that because it's a really, it's a really important part of this that I don't think you know, our our audience and our our healthcare partners necessarily have a good understanding. So, at, at, you know, is, in Ontario, is it standard to? Well, let's step back a moment. So, you know, genetic testing cannot be done easily on someone who has passed because for most of us in you know, most of us who do genetic testing in the living, we're using saliva or blood. Those, of course, become very quickly unavailable in someone who's passed. So take us, a, like, what tissue are you able to use and the process? Yeah, the vast majority of uh, people who we are involved with, especially someone who suffers a sudden cardiac death, will uh, we will be able to obtain blood. And we will be able to obtain a, a, DNA, a DNA profile from that blood. Um, if it is a longer period of time, there's other tissue that we can use. We can use tissue, um, even with a period of uh, change after death or decomposition as described. We can still obtain DNA profiles from tissue or from bone if need be. So vertebrae, hip, um, iliac crest, so the hip bone, we can still... Uh, uh, obtain DNA for uh, appropriate testing. We don't all, we, we will request genetic testing, um, which is targeted for the particular disease type, and it's a panel. So a cardiac one, if it's sudden cardiac, we have epilepsy, uh, we have atherosclerotic uh, panel, we have bleeding disorders. And I, I think those are the majority that we we will um, request, but they'll be requested on a case-by-case -case basis. And But we'll do that when we believe that's to inform the cause of death. In many situations, we won't proceed uh, with genetic, well, with genetic testing, but the family will be encouraged through Katie, for example, to link with a specialized cardiac care clinic. And then based upon the discussions between the family and the clinic professionals, we then may, we will then uh, meet their requests to send DNA in the type of testing that the clinic thinks is the most uh, valued. So it'll be more of a holistic approach that the sample from the deceased person will inform the, the evaluation of the live uh, relatives. So I'll just, I just want to drill down on this. I, I literally had this conversation last week in a, in a, with a family. So it, it, let's say you, you're, you're involved in a, you know, in a 45 year old male who passes, he, he doesn't have a cardiac history, um, has children, might, might you retain, might your office retain some tissue for DNA testing should there be something that comes up in a in a family member or yeah currently uh, we would have a sample of blood for a two year period of time in a situation like that we have just the legislature in ontario has just passed an amendment to the coroner's act that provides the ability for um, the minister to um, I, I can't actually, maybe the left-handed governor and council, I can't remember if it's minister, but to, per, to develop a regulation that defines how we can uh, retain a sample that will allow testing and retain that sample for a period of time that would be defined in the regulation. So we, as I say, for the first two years, we do have blood samples that we retain from a toxicological perspective that would be suitable for DNA testing, but we've introduced the, well, the legislation's passed the change to the legislation that allows that regulation, and the work is in process right now to develop the regulation through proper pro public consultation and proper input that will then define the period of time that we can retain for exactly the reasons that you are, because science continues to evolve, knowledge continues to gain. I mean, I think back to Pam and I having conversations many years ago, and never would we have, well, we probably did imagine, but we didn't know where we'd be today in the work that's happening. 
And so we want to be sure that we provide that opportunity for families as time goes forward, that the, we don't lose that learning opportunity from the tragedy that occurred. And yeah, no, and that's even just hearing the two years is is very good to know because it, it does take, a, you know, it takes people a while to find their way in the system. Um, you know, the, the case I was involved with recently, it, it was about a year uh, from the father's passing before I saw the son. That's a long time, especially, you know, if you consider that the son is out there, you know, doing activities, sports, all these things. Um, so, you know, we, in, in an ideal state, the, the clinician's would be brought in as soon as possible. So, so something like you've set up with, you know, with, uh, with Dr. Allen is, uh, is absolutely fantastic. I'll ask you a bit of a pointed question uh, because I know there is a dialogue, you know, a national dialogue with medical examiners and coroners. Um, in fact, our, you know, someone that did a PhD with us was in fact, you know, involved uh, presenting many years ago, Laura Dewar. And um, is there, you know, you Ontario is so you know is so far advanced in some regards. Are are people listening and and are people sort of saying you know send me what you're doing? We want to replicate this in, you know, in in British Columbia or or New Brunswick or you know what have you. Well, I can't speak for my colleagues specifically, but I can tell you that at the annual gatherings that we have, we have an annual meeting of the chief coroners and chief medical examiners. This is a topic of conversation and. Uh, Nobody in the group says, no, you're doing wrong. Um, there are legislative uh, and policy limitations in some locations. And I would encourage uh, those who are in the clinical setting to have conversation with uh, those offices to see what, what is potential, what is the opportunity, how can there be a collaborative solution developed. It may not be the same as Ontario, and it doesn't need to be the same as Ontario, but I know that there are a number of provinces who would engage in similar work. Um, I can, my understanding is after I went to the HERO uh, conference in Winnipeg and uh, that there was a relationship that developed further from with Dr. John Yunus and the Manitoba uh, uh, Medical Examiner's Office. And so there is, there are relationships that are present. I don't know them all, but I can tell you that I think everybody has the same approach of wanting to save lives and wanting to inform uh, the potential way to save lives. Now, it may not be through the, the death investigation system. There may be other avenues, but bringing together and thinking about these things is an important approach. Yeah, I won't I won't make you squirm and get kicked out of the conference there, but uh, no, thank you. Um, now, you you mentioned, you know, holding holding back a little, you know, a, a sample. And I know there have been some sensitivities and, you know, and some, some families or, or, or communities may feel, oh, you know, that's, that's very, that's very much against our beliefs. Um, have you encountered some of, some of that around blood samples or is it, blood samples people generally feel as a reasonable thing to, to retain beyond the, the ceremonial process that may follow? You know, we, we haven't faced significant uh, challenge, but we also have um, in our approaches the opportunity for any um, any wishes and desires to be articulated, and we embrace those as far as do we do an examination, don't we do an examination, do we retain or don't we retain, and so we have those conversations. Uh, we we share that 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 information with families, and if the families do have concerns with it. Um, we share why we would be potentially uh, thinking about retaining, and then uh, we respect decisions that are made and uh, and 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 work towards meeting the um, the request of the family. Now, you you have been thoughtful about more sudden deaths than most people uh, in Canada. Uh, combined, in fact, you've been you've been involved in a lot. So I'm gonna I I'd like your thoughts. So as, as you know, about half of the cases, especially in young people. So you know, I'm a pediatric specialist. So certainly in the young population, we don't find an explanation for these sudden cardiac events in about 50 percent of cases. And I'm curious. You you you've been thoughtful. You've 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 been at the you know you've you've been 
within the body. Um, what are some of your thoughts about what, you know, what is it we're not thinking of or, you know, what, what is it, what is out there that we're, we're dealing with? Even I, just some speculation is, is welcome. Yeah, I wish I knew. I sit with families, um, especially those with infants who have died at age two months, five months, six months, as many tests and as many examination things that we can think of, um, we've done and we don't have any others available to us and we still don't have answers. And it's devastating to lose a child from what I've observed and seen and heard. I can't imagine, but it's certainly what I've felt and heard from fam many, many family members. And, I, and just even more devastating to not know what happened. And so I wish I knew. And what we do is challenging for people sometimes. And you, you, you touched on this earlier, as we will say, we give a, a cause of death as unascertained. Or, and we don't know why. And so we say we don't know why. And we believe that that's the truth because we don't. Having said that, given the investigative approaches, it can be very challenging for families, again, from what I've heard and what I've seen, to not know why and then to also have been asked a lot of questions that could make people feel like we were um, indicating that they might have an idea why or they may have contributed. And that's, and that's horrible. And so we make our best efforts to, to meet with families and to have conversations with the forensic pathologist, with, with the coroner, and to really try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, again, we don't have them all, but if you ask me speculatively, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know this, but I think in 10 years, 15 years from now, we're gonna see more significant impact from understanding genetic relationship to disease. And I think we'll have more and more answers. I think that there's likely some underlying genetic finding that will explain it. Probably many of the mutations as opposed to inherited, and inherited uh, because the families didn't suffer the same challenges. But, but I'll give you an example. We, we focused on something we thought we could answer uh, for infants, which was unsafe sleep. But, and so all of the focus went on to that's why people are dying. Our babies are dying when they, they share a bed, a sleep surface, or they have sleep environment that's not um, a crib without anything in it. But I think we don't see anything at the autopsy. We don't see anything on the examination that tells us that's what it is. I don't know that that's not a contributor, but I, I really wonder, given what I understand of the percentage or the, sig the significant number of people that do share a sleep service, why a small number of deaths would occur. And, and it makes me think, it makes me think, I don't know, it makes me think that there's a natural disease process of some sort. And you know, there's different research looking at the brain stem and the maturity and the breathing center, cardiac. We, we did genetic testing. There's, there's research or studies looking at genetic testing that haven't answered um, known abnormal uh, findings, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. And so I, I, I I struggle. I think about this all the time. I think about it even more so when I'm talking with a family or when I'm hearing about these these circumstances, because it would be something to give them an answer. And even more challenging is when people are thinking to have another child and what that might impact on, on their decision. So that's a long non-answer to you. Well, it's a, no, it's a, it's a, an excellent answer and very thoughtful. And, and I completely agree. And I, it is a, it's a point that I, I like to emphasize, uh, especially for our families who are out there and wondering, like, so, you know, when, when speaking to, you know, a, a world expert on, on sudden death, who's investigated more than, you know, anyone else we know, um, and there are still a vast, you know, a large percentage, 50% that are unexplained. So these people that are, you know, wondering, you know, God, did they miss something or why, you know, did I see the wrong doctor? Um, chances are, you know, so, I mean, some of that happens, but chances are we do not know. I agree. We're learning more. Like, I mean, we've handled some of the, the, the easier diseases, like, you know, things, things where there's one genetic, you know, 
cause and pathway. We see it on an ECG or we see it on an echocardiogram. We understand those conditions, what are called monogenic mostly. And, and we're learning more and more that, you know, maybe if you have three minor genetic abnormalities, they can add up to something that looks a bit like. And so, um, so yeah, I think we will learn a lot. I always, uh, I always also talk about the autonomic nervous system and you mentioned, you know, sleep, you know, sleep and breathing control and things. So there's, we're, we'll continue to chip away at it. And it's so, it's so important to have a partner like you and your office, um, in, as part of this. And I, you know, I think, you know, Pam, in her wisdom, both of the, who's known, known as both for about the same amount of time, the, you know, ha, has always valued the relationship with the Ontario uh, coroner's office and, and maintain that dialogue. So it's an absolute delight to have you, uh, you know, talking about this. Of course, you know, in an ideal world, there are no SADS conditions and, you know, and we don't have any of this. But in, in our world, we, hit, we have a Cardiac Awareness Month. We have a World Restart the Heart Day. So it's so good to have partners like you. So thank you so much. I think, you know, I've learned a lot from you and a lot of good information that I'm going to be able to talk about with, with families and colleagues. You know, we, we have to keep working on, on, on this as a Canadian, you know, a Canadian society. Uh, it, it's as I say, it's an honor to be here. And I just do a call out to Pam because I said earlier, you know, those places where they don't have the same approach that we do, but it requires the reach out and the collaboration. Guess who reached out? Guess who reached out more than once? Guess who set meetings up? Pam. It's Pam calling Dirk. Are you going to meet with her? Yes, I am. Maybe not the first time, but the second time. And so it, it, it's people like Pam and people like the, your listeners who are making a difference, who are helping others to realize this, the tragedy they may have suffered or seen or heard about can be different. And so I hats off and credit to those, but it's tough work and it's tough situations to be in. And uh, I just reiterate my acknowledgement of that. Well, thank you. I, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, thanks again. Uh, for joining us, and um, we look forward to ongoing collaboration and dialogue over the years. Absolutely. All right. So, well, thank you so much. I, uh, you know, it's such a privilege to be part of this. You know, these webcasts, and each time I learn things, and uh, you know, and I think these people that are spending their time in the space uh, are just the most most amazing uh, people. Um, so, thank you for for joining um next month we're doing something something a little bit different we're actually going to have two sessions um and so we're going to have our we're going to talk about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in the month of november and we're going to have two different guests and uh, very excited to to have them coming next month and uh, and of course as promised i will also um, I will also have the rules of the trivia contest for those of you who are gonna gonna play along and try and win some win a prize. And uh, it, it won't be a car. I, I'll I'll tell you that. So so sorry to disappoint. Um, and as always, it's been a real honor to be part of this. And uh, we hope you have a, a a good rest of your day and week. And remember, uh, World Restart a Heart was yesterday, but you can always renew your CPR and your AED awareness and, uh, and give that gift of life to someone. So 